Well, here we are again. <laughs> Literally. Uh, thank you, Donato. That was a great lecture. Uh, this, uh, I was uh, saying that uh, we had some great discussions prior to this lecture because the sort of thinking about the microbiome sort of changes what it means in a way to, to be human in a way, you know? And I wonder, I, I wonder knowing this knowledge that you have, how does this change your perception of yourself as a human or your daily life? Does it change that? Does it alter it? Um, you know, as a, as a, as a practicing uh, scientist, um, that is the pragmatic part of my brain that tries to, um, to focus on the experiments and what needs to be done. Um, but, but certainly the, the larger question of what, of what this means is, is there and, and, is, um, and is critical. I think personally, um, the, the sense I get is that uh, if anything, um, we are probably um, even less in control than we thought we were. And we have to be more um, subtle and more aware of how um, we behave in a broad sense and what we do, because we have to, uh, to take into account this entity and entities and what we do to them with our behaviors and our choices. Um, at the same time, I have to say, as now my, my I, I am very proud of the fact, in a sense, that we have got to the point that we have become aware of this. And, I want, and there is something that I want to say, because I think it's important, to, particularly to this audience. I think it's an amazing uh, privilege for a working scientist to live and, and work and, and operate at a time when a, a whole new kind of causality is, is discovered. Um, when I when I went into biology, we thought about you know we thought about DNA, we thought about molecular biology, we and then physics and all these things, and and we we thought we would go deeper and deeper and deeper. But we but I don't think anyone had the sense that there was this enormous iceberg, out, this thing out there that no one had it, had any suspicion of. And so it's an incredible privilege to be able to do science now because I think that this is going to change fundamentally um, everything we know, as simple as that. And we have to be open-minded about it. Excellent. So we're just going to start taking some questions. We'll start here in Jordan in the front. So I have two questions. The first question is, during your talk, you had talked about how the first year of life is really important for the microbiome. Yes. Uh, why is the first year of life most important? And what happens later on in life if, say, I, as a 19-year-old, were to go and live on a farm for a year? Would I receive the same benefits as a newborn, or would it be completely different? If you think about it for a moment, you don't need me to tell you why the first year is important. Um, I think it is intuitively the case that when an organism, uh, small or, or large, doesn't matter, develops, um, you have a series of choices that, that during development can be made. And certainly you have many more choices early on than you have later on. Because you have to develop, you have to go from, from a single cell to a whole organism. And so the first year of life is, a, is, a, is an approximation. It could, be, it's th it's, it could be 11 months, it could be 13 months. I mean, it's not technically the first year, but it's the very first phase of our lives because this is the time when the things that matter, for at least for the type of discourse that I was trying to, to um, uh, have to discuss, uh, namely the, you know, the immune system, the respiratory system, all those things, that's when they develop. And that's when, therefore, you have a chance to send them one way or the other. Now, would you, as a 19-year-old, have a benefit from going and living on a farm? Um, th some of these experiments have been done, uh, and it depends. And the reason it depends, again, if it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. If you are already allergic, and you are sensitive to certain things in the environment that, for instance, are very abundant in a farm, going to a farm is not such a good idea. 
uh, like it is not if if you are sensitive to you know if you are if you are sensitive to certain pollens, go to a, to a field where the flowers that have that pollen are abundant. Um, if not, certainly some s even even as adults, some uh, some studies have reported some benefits, but I it is by no means comparable to what you can achieve if this happens early in life. So I would say the first year or at most the first six, I wouldn't want to push it much further. And then my second question is, during your talk, mm. you focused on gut microbiotica quite a bit. Um, why is there such an emphasis on that? And are there other areas of the body that are also being focused on in the same way? Um, very good question. I focused on the gut because the gut is by far the largest niche for microbes. It's the first that gets um, colonized and seems to be a little bit the conductor of the orchestra, you could say. On the other hand, um, I, I didn't have time to get into all of this, but every single part of our body has microbes, uh, essentially. Um, not the side of our brain, but the, the brain receives metabolites that are, that are shipped and that, and that travel in blood and, and in fluids. Um, and so th there is very, th there are very active research on microbes uh, in the skin and microbes in the airways and microbes uh, everywhere, essentially. So uh, this, is, this is an exploding uh, field now in every part of the body. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's go over here. Let's start here up in front. So with you saying that you've been a part of this groundbreaking study, have you found yourself doing things to change your lifestyle? Have you found yourself using less hand sanitizer to increase your microbiomes in your hand or in your palms? Have you changed your life because of what you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I'm 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 I'm, I'm, a, I'm a doctor, and so um, uh, I was already extremely sp uh, sparing in my use of antibiotics, except in extreme situations. And so, if possible, uh, I would say that even more. But again, uh, 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 when they are necessary, they are necessary. Um, and in terms of, um, <laughs> I wish I was young enough to really change my trajectory uh, by uh, cleaning my hands more or less. Uh, so I don't think that, you know, I if, I had, if I had small children around me, or, uh, that, that would be a different story. But for myself, mm, I, I, I don't think that, unfortunately, in a sense, um, that could change very much. So for the 18, 19 year olds of us in the room, would, is this something that you would recommend that we change, having so much of our life ahead of us? Um, what I think that what we need to understand, what we need to change is our awareness that these things matter. And so how, and, and so for instance, the notion that we have to uh, sanitize the environment so extremely as we do, that notion is probably wrong. And in fact, um, you know, um, in, um, allergists um, uh, are probably among the most clear examples of really not having got it for many years. Um, uh, there was a, uh, a, a study done years ago in uh, Australia where allergies were rampant. And so somebody had the idea of uh, basically eradicating all the allergens from the homes of, the ch of these children. And they, had, they called them the allergen police. They sent people to um, clean these homes uh, in, in b beyond, beyond imagination. Uh, they put these, these uh, p special pillowcases, special mattresses, special this, special that, and in, in a number of study homes. They followed these children, I don't remember for how many years, after which the study had to be interrupted because these children were much worse off than all the other children. So I think that that speaks for itself, right? Thank you. Turn the mic back here. Uh, as before this question, I want to just quick comment on something you said. Uh, you know, I think that uh, it's common for people who have really bad infections to possibly take antibiotics by yes. IV. I know this has happened to me before. Um, do we know, understand what happens after that event? I mean, is there just a m catastrophic mass extinction event that occurs in the body and, and well, how do we recover? Mm -hmm. What do we know about that? So, um, f first of all, uh, 
antibiotics still save lives. Um, and let, let's not think that be, because, because the, 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 the decrease in mortality that has occurred uh, with hygiene and antibiotics is real, and we should by no means try to go back to that situation. Yeah, absolutely. It would be criminal mm -hmm. to do that. Um, now, antibiotics should be as targeted as possible. The ideal antibiotic is, this, is the magic bullet that only kills the, antibiotic, the, the, the bug you want to get rid of without touching the others. This is a total uh, idealiz idealization. It's not possible. And the reason why it's not possible is that these bugs live in communities. And they help each other. They create niches for each other. They make things for each other that are necessary. So um, if you perturb a community, you perturb a community. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, uh, cost-benefit ratio. If you have something that threatens your well-being in a serious way, if not you, in, in, even more, if it threatens your life, I mean, you know, if the choice is between dying and being alive, uh, the, the microbiome is incredibly resilient. It's also incredibly resilient. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you know, we, we, have to, uh, we have to rely on that. And we can probably, um, learning more about it um, in, in the future, make it even more resilient, find ways to make it more resilient. So, um, but but the, so the mass extinction is probably not entirely permanent, but probably you can bring levels down enough that now the level of pathogenicity is is not high. Interesting. That's the way it is. Yeah. Um, so this whole area of research is relatively new and and really yeah. really exciting, and all these studies say that your gut microbe biome can influence your mood or your weight and things like that. Have we found any like solid causative link between either a certain set of microbes that are essential or one microbe or a phylum or something that's responsible for each of these effects in any of the studies? Yes. Yes, we are beginning to. Now, again, we are talking about studies that have been published in the last two, three years. You, you realize that. So this is pretty much uh, an evolving field where uh, you cannot, th th the field is not mature enough to say, okay, this, boom. Uh, but um, we start understanding a lot about the relationship between uh, certain microbes and disease. And, and the way to understand this is that it is not the microbe per se that is causing disease, is what the microbes produces, is the metabolites that are produced. And so, um, and these metabolites are, they're really like hormones, you realize that, because they are produced very often in the gut, but they can go everywhere in the body. So part of the reason why this is so powerful and so over um, uh, important, or all important, I should say, um, is, is because um, the we don't need to postulate that in order for microbes, for instance, to influence the way the brain functions or the mood is, they have to be in the brain because they're not. But all, all they had to do, they have to do is produce stuff that gets there. And of course, this is incredibly complicated, but we are starting to see that there are relationships. And in fact, um, we know that, for instance, uh, um, there are individuals who have this, this terrible infection with a particular microbe that is Clostridium difficile, difficile or difficile. And those individuals um, are basically uh, it not tractable with, with anything. And, 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 and they are very seriously at risk because they get dehydrated and they have these horrible uh, uh, diarrheas and they, they are seriously at risk of their lives. And the only thing that you can do and that seems to work is that you basically clean them up very heavily with antibiotics and you give them stools um, that, that restore a normal flora in their guts. And now these people are cured. And this seems to be working. So. Over here, go ahead. Um, so my question is if microbiomes are going to be used for forensics, then like, are the germs on my hand always going to be the same? Like, ah, are they that's always a very good question. There? That's a very good question. Uh, no, no. But from what we know, 
your microbes will, al will always be your microbes. And the strength there is in not going after the individual microbe, but the community and the group of them. And the, str and the reason why somebody has all of a sudden um, uh, become aware that this can be used for forensics is that, uh, as I said, we only, we humans have only, give or take, 25,000 genes. But these bugs are trillions. And so there is almost a, an endless possibility to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until you really nail it. So even though there is certainly variability depending on time, depending on, on so many things or where you are, th there will be invariance that will make those microbes yours and not mine. Hmm. Yeah, why don't you hand the mic right next to Jerry and we'll hand it back. Go ahead. So you mentioned how um, different uh, like microbes in the microbiome can determine whether or not someone might get um, like asthma or Crohn's disease. Can this be used to prevent these diseases? Um, ultimately, we think so. This is, what, this is why we're doing the research we're doing with the Amish. We think that what is in the gut of these Amish children is actually protective. And so obviously, um, once we, we need to find out what we need to find out how but when we do that is something that one can hope to use as a prevention because these children are not cured these children never get the disease so absolutely hmm. that's cool. exactly the idea over here why don't we hand the mic back and we'll kind of work it back here on both sides go ahead eric so i'm thinking of the immigration slide mm -hmm. and so we've talked a lot about and if i'm understanding this right you get exposed as a child and it leads your development in a way that you have this stronger immune system, if mm -hmm. I can say that, right? And so uh, these people come to wherever, they immigrate, they, uh, I guess they were coming to the US in that slide, right? So do we have any hints as to why their microbiome is being wiped out when they're here? And at the same time, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, and no, th at the same time, that they came in with that diversity, does that mean that they have a better chance of bouncing back, which kind of like, addresses his question, it's okay to take some antibiotics because since you had that previous. Um, so what we think is going on um, is, is, is this. The people who come, come with their microbiota, with their microbes, with their, in the, with their bugs in their guts. Um, they may uh, change it a little bit because they usually change their diet and, and but you know, in the end, when you, when you get to be an adult um, or an adult immunologically, your microbes are your microbes. Unless something catastrophic happens, that's what it is. The changes occur in their children. Because their children, so, and so that's a generational thing. And that's why it takes approximately two generations, but within a couple of generations, whatever population migrates to whatever place takes on the profile of diseases that are typical of the places they are going they went to and that's because within a couple of generations they get their pioneer taxa from their mothers and their mothers might might be a little uh, still carrying some of the original microbiota but now they are in this new place so now the interaction between what you get from the inside, let's say, and what you get from the outside is completely different. And by the next generation, bye-bye. And that's, that's why, in the end, the microbiome changes. And, and now we know that that's the case because they, the data are there. Send the mic back, hand it to Abel, then we'll come back over here. Go ahead. So I have a question on your uh, experiment. So with the germ-free mice and you uh, put in the bacteria into them, so wouldn't the bacteria actually harm the mice because they don't have an immune system to like regulate and protect against like the toxins created by the bacteria? <laughs> See, you're, you're, um, these are, um, these are uh, bacteria from healthy children, completely healthy children. Uh, so these mice are much happier. In fact, once they get these bacteria, they gain weight, they grow much better. Uh, they are no longer scruffy. Their their fur is is now nice, and no longer uh, they don't smell anymore, and that's because we we need we every hum every creature probably needs um, these microbes, and so 
it is far from being harmed. Now, what would happen if I gave them uh, uh, my, my, um, pathogens? That's a different story. But these are healthy bacteria. Okay. So See? there is a distinction between healthy and Absolutely. As I, I, as I said, uh, we don't, far from me to say that all bacteria are good. Uh, uh, th 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 there are bacteria that are um, dangerous. Uh, you don't want to have tuberculosis. You don't want to have pneumonia. You don't want to have... Uh, you know, all the things that, that uh, leishmaniosis, all those type of things. Certainly not. And for those, thank God we have antibiotics, we use them, we take care of them. But, but, but this, this is an infinitesimal part of the bugs that exist out there. That's the point. Mm. Let's go over here. Who's got the mic in the back? Go ahead, Annie. What do you see as the possible effects of the massive use of antibiotics in commercial livestock? Uh, very bad, <laughs> obviously. Um, the, uh, you, you will be uh, happy to hear possibly that both Amish and Hatterites don't use uh, antibiotics with their animals. And so more traditional uh, farming um, is antibiotic free, not, not deliberately. I mean, just because that's, that's, that's the way it is. Um, I, I think that it's, it's a problem. And I think that these type of studies <coughs> can provide very rational arguments for, in fact, limiting this type of treatments of the animals uh, because they will end up backfiring and harming us as well as them. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So in your lecture, you mentioned that there's been research done on how the microbes in our bodies can influence our mood. So I was just wondering, do you think this research can be applied to the field of like mental health? I, I definitely think so. Um, I think that this is a. This is an emerging field. I think that this is a situation in which, the relationship with the microbes is as as I said, occurs probably at a distance through things that are produced in the body and then travel. To the brain, but to the extent that that's the case, absolutely. I I again. I may be <coughs> over optimistic. I don't think so. I think that I, I don't think so. I think that by the same token by which um, immunology and inflammation have become part of essentially every aspect of medicine, there is no aspect of medicine that doesn't have to come to grips with inflammation, right? It can occur anywhere and everywhere. <coughs> I think that. I think that microbes will have to be considered as a factor, as an, en as an entity in the way we reason about everything that happens in biology, as simple as that, well, or complicated as that. Just to follow up in here, and then we'll go back to, to the back row. I, you know, I, there seems to mm. be this chain being formed. You know, you say, okay, inflammation is obviously an issue, and we have, you know, a lot of treatments are focused on the reduction of inflammation. We know that exercise, for example, is extremely healthy, and exercise can, in some sense, reduce inflammation. Mm -hmm. We know that exercise also, if, correct me if I'm wrong here, it leads to a healthier uh, microbiome. Yes. It, yes. And so yes. you see this sort of... Yes, it starts coming around. It starts around. coming around on yes, itself. Absolutely. So um, w what are your thoughts on this? And we're, you know, Obviously, there's probably more here I could add to this sort of chain. Uh, how Again... Do you my, my, um, I feel a little bit like Alice in, in Wonderland because we, we are, as, uh, I'm not exaggerating, we are discovering a whole new world. Uh, the, the possibilities and implications and ramifications of which we do not yet understand. It's too recent, it's too soon. We need to study, we need to look, we need to, we need to, be, we need to be careful. Uh, and we need to be aware. Um, I, I, can't, I don't think we can, ask, we, we can have all the answers. It's, it's too early. But um, uh, all of what you raise, uh, these are issues that need to be considered. I, I, I'm, I'm not trying not to answer the question. I don't know how to answer specifically. What I, I know... I don't know if I was answer, asking a question either. I just yeah, <laughs> no, but I think the, the point is that um, we, we, we have neighbors that over... Um, 
that outnumber us and the, uh, the, of the existence of, of whom or which we were not aware. And, and what do you do with that? Set the mic back. Go ahead, Michelle. Hi. So you mentioned the use of forensics mm. um, and microbes. So how do you think um, using microbes in forensics will change as technology advances? Um, I think it would become, um, it, it might very well become a, a mainstay of, of how forensics is done because in the end, um, when you do forensics, what you want to do is have as certain as possible an identification of someone or something, essentially someone, something living as having been a presence in a certain place, right? And so the, the more elements you can bring to bear to have that certainty, the, the, the higher that certainty can be. So again, in humans, however unlikely, there is the possibility that at least for the things that are normally looked at, two individuals come to be maybe very, very close, especially if they are related. In the case of microbiome, even if you are related, microbiomes are different. And if anything, just the, com the pure combinatoriality of it, the numbers, the sheer numbers are so high that you're going to find differences. And if you do, uh, so I think it's going to be obviously technically complicated, but you know, technology is advancing so rapidly. I mean, we, we, uh, we, we sequence now uh, in, in, in two days what took 10 years to sequence uh, only five years ago. So th that, that, that is going to be a trivial limitation over time. That's incredible. Let's go in the back. Of, yeah, go um, ahead. Hello. I also was struck by the chart of the different microbiome types in different populations in the US. And then you mentioned how quickly those microbiome types change within a generation. Um, I was thinking that we would have co-evolved with the microbiomes so that our ancestral microbiomes would have been something that would have led to our health. But if things change this quickly, do we have no connection to microbiomes of a thousand years ago or? Um, I don't know how much people have yet, yet uh, looked at microbes in, um, say, in archaeological specimens or things like that to know what the micro our microbiota of our species were uh, a thousand or two thousand or more years ago. But I would s imagine, and, I, and, and, and the data about migrations and it, it, it demonstrate very clearly that the microbiome is an extremely plastic entity. And since I think we can easily argue that our li the, co the living conditions of our species have undergone enormous changes in history, I think it stands to reason that probably our microbes have also changed a lot. Um, I, I cannot support that, but I think that th this would be my prediction. Let's go over to Noor. We're going to hand that mic over to Van. Oh, you, ja Jack, you can go next, then Van, then Noor. Oh, so Noor first, then Jack, then Van. Let's go like that. We got a lot of demand here. Go ahead, Noor. Okay, so uh, piggybacking off the, the previous question, I wanted to ask about how, Wha like, what are the similarities between like family members and their microbiomes? Are there any similarities, or is it? Oh yeah. Um, or <laughs> is it based off like their external environments and external exposure? Uh, all of the above. So, um, <coughs> if you come and spend a month at my house, the microbes in my house and the microbes on me um, will take on some of your microbes and vice versa. And if I buy a puppy and I have a dog, um, some of the dog's bugs will become part of my microbiome and vice versa. 
So this, is, which is why I was saying that it is such a plastic uh, entity. Um, so, you know, uh, however, each of us has some fundamental um, properties of our microbiota are thought to sort of mature by the time that we get adults. But certainly, if I go to China, or if I go to a very different place, or even if I go to Mexico where the diet is so different, even though the place is so close, my gut microbiota are going to change. So it, 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 it is at the same time, if you can accept that, consistent, but also plastic. But then, it, but then if it, to the extent that it is induced, for instance, changes are induced by diet, the idea is that then they revert when you go back to your normal life. So, you know, again, it's a plasticity, but it's a plasticity that is in the context of your own biology, and therefore, somehow, you and your superorganism, meta-organism, are what they are by the time you reach a certain age. Right. Jack, you got the mic. So, given the absence of Danish and Amish cows in the neighborhood, um, with well, your research big. with, with um, local households, um, what are you seeing are the benefits um, in the southwest here? And is, is the information that, that you're coming up with now, is that making its way down into pediatricians and how they advise new parents on raising their kids? Um, you know, in Europe, especially in Germany, um, a lot of farms um, are being turned into kindergartens. And uh, not kindergarten just because of, the, of how the buildings are, 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 are designed and shaped, but because the idea is that the children go there and, and spend time with animals. So mm -hmm. the, the idea there is, is becoming very pervasive. I don't see this happening here uh, yet. Uh, as far as the Southwest is concerned, we have a rather extraordinary um, example here of something that is not that dissimilar, at least conceptually, from what we see in the Amish and in the Hutterites, and is the very massive differences in asthma prevalence that we see in uh, Mexican-Americans living in Tucson and Mexican living in Mexico. The Mexican living, not, not, not d deep in Mexico, in Nogales, uh, Mexicans living in, in uh, uh, Nogales, Sonora, have three, four-fold less asthma than Mexican-Americans living in Tucson. And in fact, we're going to study that. We just submitted a big grant to study that because we think that we, the situation is not that dissimilar. We, we think that genetically, probably, uh, these, these individuals are very similar to one another. but to each other, but what, what is probably different is the type of environments in, in which they live, uh, the, 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 the microbial loads, but also the, the water that they drink and all these type of things. So we're going to study that. Mm. So is that affecting how we talk to parents about kids now? I would assume that over time this will happen. Again, this is very recent. Uh, the, the primary uh, papers that describe all, all of these effects are a couple of years old, so it takes time before these things are uh, percolating uh, sort of, you know, down. But as I said, in other parts of the world, um, they are already sort of thinking along these lines. Let's hand the mic over to Van. I think I promised him the next question, and we'll work over. So um, we talked about, like, the impact that, like, animals can have, and I was wondering... Like, each person here has, like, different microbiomes, but how do those compare to, like, the different microbiomes of different animals? Uh, they are quite, quite different, so much so that you can, in fact, tell if somebody has been in contact with a cow, um, you will find that, that there will be some cow-derived uh, microbes that, that you can detect. You know, the, 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 mi the microbes are different. The microbes are but it's not like a big enough. Well, it's a difference. But like, could you can still use those in terms of like medical and like medicine, right? Because you talk about like how, like they can affect. So it's like it's it's very different. But sure. like you could still use them for oh, medicine. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Not only they can um, probably very happily uh, find shelter in our bodies. Um, in fact, they they do. 
And so um, it's not that because they originate from a cow, they cannot then be hosted in, in us. No, 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 no. Uh, but in, you know, if you describe, so to speak, in a, in a static way, the, the communities that exist in, 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 in the poop of a cow and, and in, in mine, it's, they're probably different. But that doesn't mean that a child who, who grows up close to cows will not be able to incorporate part of those microbes in a very good way. Um, in fact, this is probably one of the sources of diversity and, and, and the properties that will protect this child. Yes, absolutely. Let's hand that mic over there. We'll work it out, hand it to Sarah first. But before, as you hand that mic, I just have a quick question here. You've talked about poop tonight yes. in the talk. You've also mentioned that that can be introduced to a person or that, that the biome from source from that mm -hmm. can be introduced to mm -hmm. a person. How, how's that? How's like, that? Are we talking to how? brownies or cookie? Or I, don't, I don't know. How do you do so, that? So I can tell you that. <laughs> so in, in the animals, um, it's very easy. You do it by gavage. You, you put it directly in the stomach. Uh, but in humans, um, human, there, are, there are treatments with fecal transplants um, in, in the C. difficile uh, infections. Okay. And what they do is they put, they put this stuff in a little capsule. They just oh, poop. And it's just poop. You just pop. You don't, you don't know what you're ingesting. Interesting. Uh, and you know, uh, and, and with, with just one of them, you, you give so many. So, yeah. so they go straight <laughs> where they should go. Boom. <laughs> Sarah. So I had a question about the parents discussion for raising the kids. So I had a lot of t I've spent a lot of time volunteering up in Phoenix and a lot of parents whenever they br would bring their kids to the pl to where I volunteered, they w all their kids it seemed like had either a gluten allergy or were lactose intolerant and they had all of these allergies that I'd never seen such a large portion of kids have. And uh, I was wondering what advice would you give to parents such as these? Because I also know a lot of them were very protective of their kids and wouldn't let them do this or that or be exposed to anything abnormal. Mm, may I ask you a question in turn? Yeah. Were those allergies real? <laughs> That's the problem is no, I no, don't know. No, let me, let I, me, I let me qualify because... Um, if you read the newspapers, uh, it seems that we are in the midst of an epidemics of these and epidemics of that. And then when you go and, and look it's, and you do this objectively, which is why I, I shipped my friends to do measurements objectively, that's not the case. And especially this gluten thing. I will not, I don't want to, you know, I, 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 I'm going to take the fifth here, but the, the, I mean, it, there is a whole industry thing, right? That is, it's, uh, now everything is gluten-free. I mean, th there are companies that will, will not um, be against the shameful idea of saying that water is gluten-free. Now, excuse me, excuse me, since when do you expect to have gluten in water? And so how can you say that water is gluten-free? So. <laughs> So mm, <laughs> that said, that said, mm, I realize that the idea is counterintuitive, but it is potentially precisely because these kids are so overprotected that they are not okay. And and maybe if these kids were a little had been a little less protected and had been. Uh, roaming the land a little bit more, it may not have been a bad idea. That said, there are also children who are uh, genetically uh, programmed to have extremely serious allergies, and that's a different story. But even in those cases, even in those cases, um, certainly trying to make sure that their um, microbiome is, is well balanced and, and is as close as possible to normal would, would be a good idea. So I feel for you because that must have been <laughs> difficult to deal with. <laughs> Hand it to Maura, please. And we'll come over here. Yeah, you're next. Okay, so with more research going into like envi environmentally based microbiomes, do you think that this will be used one day to kind of address global health issues and different health problems that occur in different regions to introduce microbiomes from like different regions to try to correct those? 
Um, potentially, I'm not sure what you have what you have in mind, but you know, if you um, imagine that, I if I were to swab to 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 to, to you know, if I if I just um, were to to swab this this um, this thing here that I don't know even how to define, <laughs> um, I would find that, that there is a ton of microbes there. There are tons of microbes on this chair. There are tons of microbes everywhere. So, um, so sure, potentially you could engineer um, the environment. You know, engineering things is always dangerous um, in, in a certain sense. And certainly to engineering things before we know exactly what we're doing. I, I would caution against engineering before we have a sense of what we're going to do. But, um, but for instance, I can tell you that there are people who try to use, and that's a good thing to do, um, to use um, microbes, soil microbes, to um, limit the very bad consequences of mine tailings in certain, part, in certain places here in Arizona. There are places where uh, vegetation, everything has been completely destroyed by, the, uh, by mines and, and everything that those mines have accumulated. And they are trying to bring back some of the soil microbes to make sure that now the soil can, um, again, m metabolize, if you allow me to use this term, all the all of this stuff, and so you know, so this is this is an example of how the environment might be um, cajoled into uh, getting a little bit back to normal after we ourselves have made all possible efforts to uh, alter it. So yeah. Right here. Uh, so that yeah. ties perfectly with my question because I was going to ask if you'd be willing to make any predictions for us about uh, the future and knowing that microbial health in humans and the environment are so closely tied and our environment is changing and the way humans are living is changing. What do you foresee happening and would that be offset at all by our new and emerging awareness of this world? That's a big question. It's a big <laughs> question, yes. Um, you know, I think I think that we'd be uh, that we will have to set priorities because um, probably we will go. We need to go f after the most the most urgent questions. Probably will always be about about diseases and things like that. But then, at the same time, um, I think that people will st hopefully, you know, it, look. It's so hard to predict what people will do because as we heard no longer than two weeks ago, um, uh, and I don't want to offend anybody, but there are people who doubt that, uh, that climate change exists. And so you know, the people who doubt that climate change exists, probably for instance, I think that in terms of mindset, may have some trouble imagining that you have to do something to preserve or, or at least be respectful of our mic your microbial environment. I mean, the people who go uh, drill, baby drill, I, I don't know how respectful they would be of these entities. So that's why it's, it's hard to, to, to predict what the society will do as a whole. Certainly, I think that over time, we're going to develop tools to do these things if we want to use them. That's a different story. I hope we do. Let's do two more questions. Um, yeah, Jacob, why don't you... You had an extraordinary audience, I have to say. <laughs> I could stay here for ever if I were not as hungry as I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's but, why we're... But you are, you, are, you are pretty... Go it's fun. Go it's ahead, really Jacob. fun. So I'm from uh, Fresno, California, which is a... It's kind of um, a... Uh, a, uh, a had I, or so what was the name of the... the besides the Amish, the... Uh, Hutterites. The Hutterites. It's kind of a Hutterite situation where we have um, we have a lot of like high tech, yeah. uh, agricultural equipment, but ne not necessarily are we putting our kids next to a lot of animals. Yeah. Um, and yet we get all this air pollution that's uh, causing a lot of asthma and allergies. Uh, sure. And almost to the point where our second biggest industry is like these asthma centers that are all dotting our city. Uh, so do you? Uh, this is kind of a follow-up to um, the previous person's question, but do you expect that we're going to have um, 
treatments, almost like vaccines, where we're going to be giving uh, uh, microbiomes to children and like introducing it to them early to if, if we know that they're going to be growing up in an area like this? You know, we do science to understand things. Um, we cannot expect miracles. Microbes are living things, right? So if you create an environment that either kills or alters those microbes, uh, to imagine, you, you, you could hope that you can then engineer some microbes that if you put them in that same environment won't be affected, but I mean, it's a pretty long shot. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that the, the game-changing aspect of this whole thing in my mind is that we could come to the realization that certain things have certain consequences and that because they have certain consequences, now you can move to behaving differently. Um, vaccinations, for sure. We, I think that, um, in a sense, you could argue that the Amish children um, are, are vaccinated. Um, by by the fact that they are exp and, and so are the Bavarian children, you know that they from very very early on they they are uh, exposed to these things that rebalance their immune systems. Um, but I don't know that the solution is then to throw them into a place that has all the pollution and so. so in other words, all these things should should go together. But certainly, certainly, the fact is that even in environments. Uh, that are at very high risk, that are individuals who resist those risks, who are not, um, who do, do not fall under uh, the, the, the dangers of those risks. So it means that you can protect, and, and I think that probably it will turn out that microbes have a lot to do with protecting those individuals, and therefore probably we can use those things once we know how they work. Yes. So in a, so in like a clinical sense, introducing our own pre-selected, you know, um, microbes into a, into, um, a patient might have like a lot, it, you know, our microbiomes are very complex, so it might have unforeseen consequences, uh, negatively. Uh, sure. Um, and, and again, we are at the dawn of this, it, it, of, of the, at the dawn of a new era here. And we, there are a lot of things we don't understand. One thing that we understand, qualitatively still, not quantitatively, but, but we understand it at least in, as a concept, is that microbes don't come as individual entities. They come as communities. They come as packages, as, as groups, as communities, really. And, and that's because of the way they live and, and grow. So the notion that you can take a single microbe and sol solve a problem by giving that microbe is not going to work. Even, I was mentioning the C. difficile type of treatment, um, and there, you know, this is a particularly aggressive strain and everything else, and you give microbiota. Very, over time, some of these patients relapse because because if you don't have a niche that supports a, a, the, the, a good growth of many communities, that the diversi diversity seems to be so important. Now, diversity makes things difficult clinically because it means that you cannot transfer a single thing, that you can grow, put it in a pill, and give. So we, we, have, a lot of, we have a lot to learn. Thank you. All right, final question. Josh. First of all, just on behalf of all of us, thank you so much. It's given us a new perspective of what we are. I appreciate that. Thanks. Second, um, teaching is really hard. Um, I think everybody in this room is probably going to agree that it's hard. And I think there's a lot of reasons sure. that people leave teaching in the first mm. couple of years. Mm. One, I think it's that they get sick a lot. And that traditionally teachers are at the front of the room. Mm -hmm. People are talking at them, speaking yep. to them in that direction. Yep. And also, I'm not sure, man. Should we be shaking hands, fist bumping, bowing? What should we be doing? Like, what's, 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 what's an appropriate way to say hi to our students? And should we change up the paradigm of the classroom and how we teach them? Look, um, I was born and, and I grew up in Italy, and you go to school in Italy when you are six years old. 
you don't go to at, at when at least at my in my time you uh, you didn't go to ki kindergarten as much as um, as as children do here. So you know, first five years of my life, I was with my parents, with my friends, but I I was sort of probably quite protected. I went to school when I was six, and the first three months of school, I was home sick for 45 days out of three months. I was basically sick all the time because I had not exposed, been to exposed to anything. I was I was a social case. I was sick all the time, and and. Uh, that was the first trimester of, of the year. The second trimester, I was sick probably a week. And from there on, boom. I mean, that's what immunity is. So, you know, um, getting sick is fine. I think that the point is that getting sick is totally fine. Um, is how you train your immune system. And the point is that you shouldn't get sick to the point that that, and, and your children should not get sick to the point that that gets out of control. But the fact that all the, the children get sick and with rhinovirus, all these things, I mean, it's, it's part of, of how the immune system develops. So I don't think that, that's a, that one should be over um, careful. And in fact, the children, you, you, I'm sure you're aware of this data, um, in the case of asthma, one of the strongest protective factors against asthma is to have been at... Um, um, not kindergarten, but um, uh, sorry, I'm blanking on the name because now I'm tired. In, in essentially, ch child care early on. Daycare, oh, sorry, daycare. Children who go to daycare early, very early, now they have more infections. So if you look at infections, they have more infections. So they're not healthier in the sense that they have less infections. But they have, for instance, much less asthma than children who don't. And you know why? Probably because they get all these microbes from the, the other children. And so it's a balance between the being exposed to infectious agents, but also training your immune system in such a way that ultimately you're better off. So are you saying we should thank our students for getting us sick? Yes. No, uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just I'm kidding, saying I'm, I'm saying that you are the you not I uh, know I think that the students should thank the other students and you because you are the the microbial environment in which they are and these things need to go around whether we like it or not and as long as they do are not out of control sorry pal that's the way it is thank you so much I appreciate <laughs> it thank you thank you thank you thank you, <laughs> thank you. We're going to continue this. We'll be back next week with Kati and more on, on the microbiome and extending this discussion for sure. Now this is a fantastic um, uh, initiative. So congratulations to you, you and to you all mm -hmm. for doing this. Thank all right. you. I'll see Thank everybody. You. Thank, Thank you. you.